My name is Josh Dyson. Um, I head of school at Classical School, uh, Wichita. My fifth year uh, at CSW. Um, my first four years were in a role that we call Director of Operations. Um, and you may have heard uh, Scotty Mack refer to, um, or maybe it's Brad, talking about Wade Ortigo was there uh, for the five years. And we overlapped by four years. Um, of course, Wade moved up to Idaho and I didn't necessarily just step right into the position. I took an interim role um, for the first semester and then they uh, extended the offer uh, there last November. So uh, continuing to get my feet wet and head a school role, um, though this is continuing or finishing up the fifth year in administrative uh, role. What I'm talking about today is not an area that I'm an expert in, it's an area that I've had epiphanies in. Um, from, from reading and, had, and having these aha moments. Uh, so my hope um, for you is that there might be some aha moments uh, that result from this. A number of you have much more experience than I do in the actual thing. Um, so as you listen, I, I hope that I don't um, overstep my bounds or uh, talk too confidently. That's not my intention, but I hope there is much to be gleaned as we rely on these other sources. Like it or not, you're a negotiator. Anybody heard that line before? Like it or not, you're a negotiator. Anybody knows what it's from? What book that's from? It's from Getting to Yes by William Urey. It's one of the kind of um, most famous negotiation strategy books from Harvard Business School. Um, like it or not, you're a negotiator. And the position that they're taking in this is that every interaction that we have is in some form, some way, a negotiation. The first book that I read by Yuri was called uh, The Power of a Positive No. I, I say I read, I actually was listening to the audio book. And, you know, of course, I'm a 35-minute commute, so I'm constantly going through audio books. You know, The Power of a Positive No... And the title, you know, whenever you, whenever you read it, it sounds um, than maybe a classical education book. Uh, but for whatever reason, I decided to go ahead and, and dive in and took a chance on it. Um, and it. And it revolutionized the way that I viewed um, interactions with parents um, and faculty, um, students, uh, just my, my own family, how I thought about my relationship to my wife. Uh, and kids, and, and I can say that probably outside of the scripture might be the most influential non-fiction book that I've read or, or listened to, whatever you want to call it, the past five years. So Yuri, of course, um, being there at Harvard Business School as a negotiation master, it's incredible to listen to some of his stories that he's gone into um, these groups in guerrilla warfare and help them negotiate um, out peace deals and those kind of things. Um, as we go in and look at these tactics, though, I want uh, us to think about how this relates, of course, to our context in schools, whether it's as administrators, as a teacher dealing with your uh, you know, parents, students, and I hopefully uh, personally um, is beneficial as well. But I think it's much, much more benefit than just talking money or negotiating international nuclear deals, uh, but can actually have a impact on every one of our interpersonal relationship. And we're talking about negotiation here, it's not, it's not a matter of how to make sure that you get what's yours. I, I don't want that to be the, the thought that's going through your head. This is not a how to make sure you don't get messed over, how to make sure that you get everything you can out of the deal. This is a, it, the heart of the matter is how do we interact with the other person and help each other arrive um, at a solution that's mutually beneficial. Because the reality is that conflict exists in every area of our life, and we experience conflict every single day. Essentially, it seems to come down to this. Someone wants us to say yes. Right? Someone comes to us, and they want us to say yes to them. And we must weigh out our responses. Do we say yes? Do we say no? Or do we 
avoid and kick the can down a little further. Some of these are simple. You may have a salesperson calls you. Can I have five minutes of your time? Yes or no. Your child, can we eat at McDonald's? Yes or no. Can we watch something else? Some get a little bit more difficult. I don't know if anybody's experienced these kind of situations. Or a teacher comes to you with a reimbursement form for their expenses. Says, can you sign this? I want a few dollars over what I thought it would be. That's a little more difficult situation there. Or you have a faculty meeting that day, and the staff member, right, five minutes before says, hey, is it okay if I miss the faculty meeting today? Okay. Some of these are not as easy to say yes or no to. In most situations we encounter, there actually is no question presented at all. The basic premise of this talk is that while we must say no, and no is very important, yes is where we must begin. Many of you have heard the phrase, every yes is a no to something else. Right? Is that familiar? phrase to you, anytime you say yes, you are saying no, that is something else, um, which is so true, but what I want to get to is actually even beyond that, because beyond, when you say yes, okay, and then that's a, a no to something else, but there's another yes that's even further beyond, and we have to dig and dig uh, to get to that deepest yes. As Simon Sinek says, it starts with why, what I would say is it starts with yes, and I think ultimately it's really the same thing uh, that we're saying. And as you look on your sheet, there are, of course, well-known passage in 2 Corinthians 1, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Sylvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes and him. God is not a God of no. He is a God of yes. And you're probably thinking, well, about every commandment I know the Bible is thou shalt not, so that sounds rather contradictory. But the reason is, we know that behind every one of those no commandments, there is a strong yes. And what do those come down to? Two things, right? Yes, do love the Lord your God. And yes, do love your neighbor as yourself. These are deeper yeses that lead to the no's. As we start to unpack this, we think about adultery, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. The yes, what's the yes there? Right? You shalt love your own wife and your own children and all kinds of others that are affected by that. Or the key to us not committing adultery is not thinking about the no of not committing adultery, and that's like four negatives I just threw into one <laughs> string there, is thinking about the yes. What are we saying yes to? The key to an enduring no is to remind yourself of that yes. So uh, on there is kind of this, this pattern. Uh, it says yes, number one, uh, no, yes, number two on your notes, I believe, right? Um, and thinking kind of through a logic of how to approach this, um, you're presented with a scenario and the response. We'll get this a little bit later. The first response when somebody's presenting you with this question is yes. And not necessarily yes to the question. It's yes to what is that uncompromising vision or thing that you are saying, you're, you're asking the question, but I'm going to tell you, here's what I can say yes to. And then we're going to evaluate what you... 
yes or no. Maybe that's a no if it falls outside of that. But then there's another yes, and it's an invitation to say, hey, no, but how about this? How about this, uh, this other thing that I think would be yes there? We'll keep continuing to unpack these. The, the tree analogy there, you can see kind of to visualize it, uh, the roots of having what that strong, deep yes is rooted in the ground, turning into a no, and then the branches reach out as an invitation, uh, as a secondary yes. Come and join me in this thing. What happens to me as I kind of run into these situations, I, I'll feel myself become disoriented. And I, I don't know how you are. This is just kind of reflecting on, on my own experience. Normally, I make decisions like that. I mean, I just, bam. I, don't, I imagine a lot of administrators are the same way. Somebody asks a question, bam, decision made. You, know, you don't even remember. You've made 100 decisions in a, in a day. You can't remember them all, right? But then you'll get hit by this thing. And what, ha or what happens to me, I get hit by this thing, and it's disorienting. And I, and I don't know what to say. I don't know if it's yes or no. And, and maybe I might be inclined, like I, I want to say no, but I can't, I can't figure out why I want to say no. And, of course, this person really wants me to say yes. Um, and I get into this kind of mode where I freeze up. And what I've realized when that happens for me is that I've lost touch with what that deepest yes is, and I must recenter myself and ask myself, what is the yes here? What is the yes that I cannot compromise? And once that yes is established, the no is just an outworking of that. It's just a natural, it's just the natural conclusion. It's the logical thing. The yes says it, and if it's not there, um, then it's, it's a no, and often you don't have to say no. You just clearly articulate what the yes is. So I think about a couple of examples uh, recently. Mr. Dyson, can we wear our normal clothes when we do our rhetoric presentations? All right, who knows what normal clothes means? This is, I, I think, okay. Yes. What I desire is for you guys to look as good, if not better, than you do on a daily basis. I just, did I say yes or no to them? I don't know if I said yes or no to them, right? It doesn't actually matter. But I've told them what the yes is. Another similar situation, you know, these seniors, you know how it is. Mr. Dyson, can we skip the pep rally since we are seniors? Right, privilege, senior privilege. Of course, responses, what I desire is that you guys would be a good example to younger students. Right? The, the, the no is inherent in the yes. It's important for us to think about and consider how big our yes is. And as, as we can establish the thing and we think about what are the parameters of it, once it's established and we know what that is, we know that everything inside that we can say yes to, which is a wonderful place to be. It's a wonderful place as an, as an administrator, as a head of school, and I hope you feel the same way, to be able to say yes to as many things as possible. Right? I love to say yes. I know my teachers may not agree with that, but I, I do. I actually do enjoy saying yes. And if we can make clear what that is, we have a giant tent and say, if you can exist in here, then the yes, go for it. That would be wonderful. But if it's outside of those parameters, I have no choice. It simply cannot be a yes. Right? It's not, it, this is not a personal matter. It takes the whole personal thing out of it, right? Because that's the biggest, the biggest issue we run into with saying no, is that no is deeply personal. It is, a, it is rejection for people. And by clarifying the tent of our yes, it takes the personal element out. Right? It's like we have, I think most of us have fences around our playgrounds. And it's for our kids. They know exactly how far 
They can go. Here's, here's your boundary here, right? Go explore the whole thing. And they do, and, and, it, and it's, it's a great thing for them. Well, you take that fence away, and then you start to have the fear and anxiety. How, how far can we go, right? Um, and they actually, it's counterproductive. So know how, how big your yes is. Know what the parameters are, and seek to say yes to every single thing you possibly can, unless you just can't. It's not a personal matter. So who, is any, does anybody love to say no? Here there are some, some people who do love saying no, right? Most of us don't love saying no because it's a conflict word. And generally we avoid conflict at all cost. I think generally it's mostly a healthy thing. The conflict, of course, is a part of life, and, in, and no is an inescapable thing. But we try to avoid it anyway. Uh, so we do. You'll see these uh, three options that Yuri um, indicates on there near the bottom of your page. The AAA trap. For one, we accommodate out of fear or guilt. We attack back out of anger or we run avoid out of fear as you think through I maybe I'm I'm thinking likely you have scenarios that you might can identify with each of those things for yourself All right think through that you know what are some some times that I said yes and I shouldn't have right or I got defensive and pushed back I can think of some pretty some instances pretty quickly are that we just keep on avoiding. Of course, it's not easy saying no. We tend to be reactionary and not intentional with those no's. The real action, though, takes place inside of you, inside of me, before this whole thing begins. We must address ourselves before we're going to be ready to handle this. We need to stop before responding. We need to seek to gain perspective, to go beyond the no to the deepest yes. But Yuri says that the biggest obstacle is, of course, ourselves. We quickly adopt an adversarial attitude. We get a win-lose mindset, an us-versus-them mindset, whoever it is, whether it's a parent coming in, um, with our spouse, whatever it may be. We get this, this kind of us-versus-them. We have what, what we call a sense of scarcity, right, a fixed sum kind of game where there's only this much, and I better make sure I get what's mine, right? We think of this in almost mathematical terms. Like there's 100%, I need to at least get 51%. Right? So we, have, we go into this mode of, of trying to fight over these resources, so which puts us into this defense mode. But if we are willing to first influence ourselves and seek to turn ourselves from opponents and the allies, that changes everything. Yuri has a, a, another book in his series called Getting to Yes with Yourself. Anybody read that? Or Getting to Yes with Yourself. It's, it's interesting to see kind of how he develops through this, especially from a secular mentality. Um, what he realizes as you see the development of, of these series of books is that as he comes to, to terms that the problem is internal, he, of course, seeks for the solution to that. And as we know, secularists find all kinds of goofy ways of dealing with the internal turmoil, and, and he believes that the answer is found in some kind of inside himself thing, right? But you listen to what he says, and it's like there's so much truth there still. 
And you wonder, as people who embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, we should be knocking this out of the park. We should be the best at dealing with conflict of anyone. Because, right, we have the peace of Christ. We have the freedom from guilt. We have the freedom from shame, from fear. Yet, in these difficult conversations, we abandon the gospel. We attack out of anger. We run, avoid out of fear. We're like, we're back to Adam and Eve in the garden again. We're defending ourselves. We're worried about the future. Think about our own image and status. The gospel of Jesus Christ should free us to embrace conflict not avoid it. It is quite sad that Christians, many Christians, actually use the gospel as an excuse to avoid conflict. They'll gloss over conflict in the name of Jesus. When in reality, we should be stepping into it because there is nothing at stake for us. We are safe in Christ. Our identity is in Christ. Right? What, what can man do to me? Right? The, when it comes down to it, we, this is a gospel issue. I'm going to run through a few um, of the tactics, and I have those tactics um, there uh, to think about as we approach these Issues, and I'll try and go through quickly and have some time for us to kind of talk about um, our own scenario situations. Uh, so the principles that I have on there, for one, separate the people from the problem. Two, focus on interest, not positions. Three, go to the balcony. Four, get creative and invite their participation. And five, create BATNA. Some of these you may find more relevant than others. The first one is separate the people from the problem. Are we approaching this conflict as adversaries or as partners? The person across from you, if you're sitting down in your office, and I don't know what context you're in, I'm, I'm imagining myself in an office, right, and they come and they sit across the desk. The person across from you is not the problem. The problem is not the person that walked in your door. The problem is the problem. The problem itself is the problem. When we approach conflict with someone, we have a few options. We can take the adversarial approach, this hard, you know, win-lose scenario. We can take a soft approach. Right? Where we just kind of, you know, you come in and you let the other person just kind of walk all over you and, you know, the other person gains, but I may not gain. We avoid the problem as a third option or we seek a win-win solution. Or if you go like Stephen Covey, win-win uh, or no deal. What has been a, a significant thing for me is to, in my imagination, actually change my orientation to the other person from face to face to actually join them side by side. Whenever I take a parent phone call that I think might be a difficult conversation, I'll go to my office and I'll sit down not in my chair, I'll sit down actually in the parent chair and I'll look back at 
my normal office chair and I'm envisioning myself like I'm on their side and we're dealing with this issue together. This is, more, this is sometimes more difficult. Um, of course, I don't know what your setup is. When you have a physical encounter, there are times whenever you actually can get a table and you know, they say negotiation, a lot of negotiation people say we should do is you should actually sit on the same side of the table when you're doing negotiation. Um, in my context, I, just, I try to envision myself, if there's a parent across from me, like I'm sitting with them, right? And we're both looking back and trying to figure out what, what is the problem? Let's attack this problem together. Because otherwise, it's really hard not to take it personally with it, with it being said, right? It becomes us versus them. So I encourage you to find a way to do that, whether you physically can or just in your imagination uh, to do so. Of course, one of the most important things that we can do is to put ourselves in their shoes. Just this couple weeks ago, I had a scenario where a parent asked me to take action on something. Right? And I ended up having to say, no, I'm not going to. But I told her, I said, but if I were in your shoes, I would expect the same thing. I understand why you're, I, I understand why you're saying that. And my interpretation of our document tells me that I, that I can't do it. Um, but I, I sympathize with you here. And I said, and I invite you to appeal to our board if you feel like that's what you need to do, and I'll hand deliver it to them. No hard feelings at all. I would probably do the same thing, right? Because that's the process, right? We, we get in this, in this kind of defense mode where it's like, oh, you know, my and the parents are like, oh, I'm, I'm going to take this to the board, right? And we're all getting to fight mode. Instead, just, just welcome and say, hey, let's, yeah, let's, let's do it. Yeah, I, I would do the same thing. Yeah, let me, let me help you with that. Let, let's take it to the board. I'll talk to them and say, there's, there's all these men and women up there who have wisdom. I'm one, I'm one guy. And I might get this wrong. And that's okay. Right? As Brad said so well this morning, right, this series of repentances. Um, and I think sometimes we try to get in a scenario where we try to avoid future repentance. We cannot avoid future repentance. We will be repenting for the rest of our careers and the rest of our lives. We don't need to position ourselves to you know, make sure we don't get in a situation where we have to repent. I will be repenting again. That's okay. Of course, empathy is such an important thing. I am no pro at empathy. That is definitely way down on, on my um, skill level list, um, but it's something I'm you know, continually seeking to grow in. Seeking to truly listen to them. They let off steam. They're pouring out their grievances. Of course, we're actively listening. You know these, you know these things. And truly seeking, and I can say this, I know you know this, but I don't know if, if we can hear it enough. Truly seeking to understand. That's such a simple idea. That how often I find myself, I'm not trying to understand. I'm trying to create my defense. I'm trying to preempt the strife. But we should be seeking truly to listen. Why? Because the gospel allows us to. We seek to stay in the present. What happens, and, and, and I found, and maybe you can attest to this as well, I hope, um, is that as we sit there in the present and we're listening in so many scenarios now, I, have no, like, I, I really don't know what I'm going to say. And, and, I've, and I've generally abandoned the idea of needing to have a response ready. Just seeking to be present and listen and say, wow, yeah, I don't know. 
But what, what starts to unfold, the more that we listen, is that the answers start to reveal themselves. And they're almost always there. Almost always an opening comes up and you think, that's it. Now, I think I understand what's happening. But we can't be there. We can't get to that point if we're fixated on the past. The whole time they're talking, we're just thinking about all the things that they've done. Or we're anxious about the future. The only place where we can do this is by being in the present, right there with them. The most important thing we can do is to show them respect. Deal with them as a human being and deal with a problem on its merits. We're separating people from problem. Respect is basically a yes to the other person's dignity and their value. William Murray says, Never take a person's dignity that is worth everything to them and nothing to you. Never take a person's dignity that's worth everything to them and it's worth nothing to you. I know that it is hard to respect some people. I have those parents too. But we must remember they are made in the image of God at the very least. Trusting that they are being conformed to the image of his son. Be hard on the problem, not on the person. Next, focus on interest and not positions. This is this was remarkable thing for me whenever I finally understood what, what this was. Positions and interest. The position, someone's position is the what, but their interest are the why. Uncovering interest opens up new possibilities that might have seemed impossible before. So someone comes into your office, your classroom, whatever it is, almost always what they're going to present you with is a position. Parents shouldn't be allowed to enter the building before 7.50 a.m. Okay. Thank you. That's a position. On the other side... Your teachers assign too much homework. Okay. There are too many sports in this school. All these are positions. None of those are interests. No one actually told you anything there of what they really want. They've taken a position that they think will give them what they want and almost never does. And if we focus on their position, if they come and present a position to us and we engage with that position and, and interact with that on that position, we are setting ourselves up for failure. So many times that's not going to end well. And get another example to think about what am I talking about? And sometimes it's kind of hard to understand kind of what, what is position, what is interest. So here's kind of a simple example. Imagine that window is open, it's cold outside. The position is that window should be closed. That's a position. You're saying that that needs to happen. Okay? But what, what are they really saying? What are they really saying when they're saying that window must be closed? Exactly. Their desires actually be warm. Right? 
So we think about, okay, well, there's also some other ways that this could be solved. We could get a space eater for them. They could put a blanket on. They could move. We could maybe close the window part way, right? There's, there's, there's all these different possible outcomes, different, different things that could solve their basic interest still. But what they're going to bring to you is not their interest. They're not going to say, hey, I really want to be warm. Can you give me some possibilities of what that could look like? That would be wonderful, wouldn't it, if all parents were like, and, and you do sometimes. I mean, there, we have some great parents, and, the, and, that, and that does happen. Sometimes my parents, there's some great times. It's like, that's so wonderful. Thank you for, for putting it that way. But usually it's not, right? And what we have to do is think through what is it, what's behind this, and help through that, through that conversation to seek to get behind what those things are. Because people assume that just because our positions are in, are in conflict, that our interests are also in conflict. But almost always in settings like ours, where we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are about the same goal, and we have the same vision in mind for these kids and, and for these teachers, almost always our interests are actually very much aligned. We just have different views on how we think that might work out. And in conversation, we can kind of help each other understand those things. Sometimes a helpful question for me, so I was in a talk not long ago with our um, landlord and said, essentially, no more than 350 students allowed on site. Where do they even come from? Where does 350 even come from, right? Um, but instead of, of course, being, no, we have to have more than 350. We, we, we want to have 400. Is what, do you, what do you, what do you, does, like, what, what's the interest that you have? What are you seeking to accomplish when you say that? And the response was, well, we want to make sure that all of our big spaces don't get cut into small spaces. Oh, okay. That's, that's a totally different thing, right? I have all kinds of ideas about how we can solve that problem. But if, if we didn't seek to get behind that position, we would have locked horns on something that didn't matter. Go to the balcony. Uh, this is a strategy that, um, that Yuri... Um, talks about and, and maybe you do something like this. What, what I've often found is that when I get into these conflict situations, I can physically feel myself change, right? Heart, heart, uh, heart rate increases, teeth start to chatter, hands start to get jittery, right? I mean, I don't know if anybody else experiences. There, there, there are a number of instances over the past number of years where I feel a physiological change in my person as a conflict arises. Anybody else ever have anything like that? Maybe I'm just by myself on that. Yeah. What Yuri says is that we envision ourselves going to the balcony. And what he's saying is that imagine that you are an actor in a play with this other person on the stage. Take yourself, remove yourself, and go to the balcony and seek to look back on this interaction as if you're a third party, right? And then see if you can name what's happening. You see this person kind of maybe even jabbing at you. You can, you can identify, hey, th this person is saying this to try to get a reaction, right? More important than that is so you can name what's happening inside yourself. I can speak for myself that naming my emotions is not a strength. Sometimes it's even difficult for me to call it what it is. But the separation, to be able to look at it objectively 
and then reminder of the gospel that it's okay. There's nothing at stake here. It allows me to say something like, I am experiencing anger right now. I am experiencing fear right now. And if you are, are willing to step back and call it what it is, it's amazing how it takes the, takes the power out of that emotion, right? It doesn't go away when you're dealing with it. You're dealing with yourself as you actually are. And it helps to put things in perspective. We're going to jump on from there to number four, get creative and invite their participation. Chris Voss, author of Never Split the Difference. Anybody read Never Split the Difference? Chris Voss, who's FBI negotiator, um, says the most important question to master is, how am I supposed to do that? To the other party, they've made a request. How am I supposed to do that? What is, what is particularly important here is that it actually has to be genuine, not a flippant question, not sarcastic. 